Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 579 of the podcast and it is Friday the 15th of October 2021 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking about how to research your book with Vicky Carter, the author's librarian. We talk about why research is so important for fiction and non-fiction, different research techniques, how to keep track of your notes, and how to acknowledge your sources and do citations appropriately to avoid unintentional plagiarism, as well as how to build your community by referring other authors, plus how to get your book into libraries. So I am a research addict. <laughs> this was a fun discussion coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news. So Jane Friedman in the hot sheet shared a link to an article in the New Republic, which asks the question, has Amazon changed fiction? Is this a new age of literature shaped by an algorithm? And it basically discusses a new book called Everything and Less, the novel in the age of Amazon by Mark McGill, who's a professor of literature at Stanford University. So essentially, he says that platforms for literature subject it to the same homogenizing effects. And because anyone can self-publish on KDP, it bypasses the publishing world's usual hierarchy of gatekeepers. But it also says the ultimate gatekeeper for KDP is Amazon itself, which rewards specific kinds of books and authors, promoting them through its recommendation feeds. Now, of course, <laughs> this is my comment. This assumes that the Amazon literature is self-published, but of course, most publishers sell their books on Amazon and are subject to the same algorithm. <laughs> and as I'll come to in a minute, there's another article that kind of feeds into this too. But uh, yeah, that that made me go, yeah, this is not about self-publishing. This is also about traditional publishers chasing rankings and algorithms. The article says Amazon, with its public rankings, star ratings and review counts, makes it impossible to think of literature as existing outside of a marketplace of money and attention. And again, my comment is, well, that's if you focus just on Amazon. <laughs> There are plenty of other places uh, where you can sell books. Uh, but it says Amazon's way of doing business with the publishing industry endangers literary fiction. Amazon has squeezed publisher profits, making it harder for them to take risks on titles that aren't likely to bring home large returns. And again, I would say, well, publishers could build their own direct platforms. And that's what we're starting to see. And that's what I've obviously been encouraging you to do as authors too. I you know, I'm a shareholder in Amazon. I think it's a fantastic company. I love the fact that I can publish my books on Amazon. I'm a total fan. I'm a user uh, of Amazon, <laughs> probably in all the senses of user. Uh, I, I think it's brilliant. But I publish wide. I put my books in everywhere possible, including libraries, as we'll talk about today. And I want people to be able to buy my books from every place they possibly can. So I, it, it annoys me when these articles kind of make it seem that, um, of course, Amazon is dominant in some areas, but not everything. And it's our responsibility to drive the industry in a direction that we want it to go, instead of blaming Amazon for being excellent. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think it's the the publishers are uh, clubbing together more and more, taking each other over and becoming bigger and bigger. They have a very dominant role if they want to. They just haven't chosen to go that way. Just to carry on with the article, <laughs> it says, dive into the system and embrace what you find there as the vanguard of culture, no matter if most of it is dull. <laughs> I thought this was such a kind of takedown. Uh, but yeah, for me, I think there's a lot to be said in, in sort of rebuffing this. 
And as I said, I think this article is especially interesting if you pair it with another article from The Atlantic, which Passive Guy posted on his blog this week, entitled The Bigger the Publisher, The Blander the Books, by Dennis Johnson, about the Penguin Random House Simon & Schuster merger. It says, The bigger the big publishers get, the more risk-averse they become, the less willing they are to lose money. Audiences need to be expanded, not necessarily diversified. Then the safer, less boat-rocking, bigger demographic satisfying stuff they publish becomes what the marketplace they dominate adapts itself to sell. The risk aversion becomes systemic. As the big houses have become bigger and bigger, their business has become more about making money than art or protest, so that small publishers now provide a far wider variety of literature, politics, history and journalism, of art making and truth to power speaking, of actual risk taking, and from a far more diverse group of authors than the commercial conglomerate publishers. And so, of course, both of these articles have some truth to them. Of course, you've noticed this as a reader, let alone listening to the author community who, you know, write to market for algorithms. Not everyone, obviously. And of course, if you do, that's completely valid as well. (laughs) But as a reader, for example, I've pretty much stopped reading the crime genre here in the UK as so many books seem to be exactly the same. And this is traditionally published and indie, uh, even with exactly the same covers. It's very hard to tell them apart. And I read a lot of books for various things. And uh, they really are. So many of them are exactly the same. And this is a combination of indie and traditionally published books, all of whom, remember, are chasing algorithms. But I have found an incredible diversity of writing amongst independent press So this is traditional publishing, but the small presses who focus much more on their own, the taste of the editors in those presses and indie authors who publish outside of the sort of main genres. Uh, I read particularly horror and speculative fiction, again, both traditionally published and indie. And boy, there's a lot of what I would call literature in there. I think uh, horror, especially in spec fic, do... Uh, lend themselves to creating quite unusual forms of writing in different art, mainly because they're standalones as well, rather than a series. And of course, the lesson here is twofold, I think. One is about widening our reading beyond the charts. So as readers, going to look for the more original work in different places other than the charts. Like if you if you buy from the charts, obviously, great. That is by definition mass market. That is by definition something that appeals to a lot of people. And the uh, where you might find lists of, for example, I shop from the Bram, Bram Stoker long list. Uh, you'll often find some real gems in there that will never top the charts. <laughs> but are really, really interesting. And, uh, or, you know, magazines, specifically genre websites, I get things from there as well. Twitter, obviously, I get a lot of recommendations from Twitter. But it's our responsibility as readers to go looking for things that are further out than mass market. And also for us as writers, only we can decide what we want to write with the limited time we have upon this earth. And of course, we want to reach readers and make money. So writing books that sell a lot is a good idea. Writing to market, writing to keywords, writing to categories, writing to our readers. You know, I write series. I'm just about to put book 12 out in my arcane thrillers. Uh, They don't top the charts, (laughs) but, you know, they're still aimed to be in the conspiracy thriller slash religious thriller, uh, Dan Brown fan type of market, which isn't topping the charts right now, but you never know, it'll come back. So there's nothing wrong with either of these things. It's just we get to decide our creative futures. And we don't get to say, oh, it's Amazon's fault. Oh, it's this, that and the other. We get to shape the future. And I, I fully believe that. And talking of taking more risks, interestingly, the Irish Times announced this week a basic income pilot scheme for artists, which could see around 2,000 creative workers drawing income from March 2022. The three-year pilot will involve a weekly payment of around €325 a week, which I think would probably be around $400-$500 a week. Um, The scheme sends a message to artists living and working in Ireland that their work is valued, appreciated and necessary. 
No, I I really like this. And I have, over the last few years, obviously, we've all been reading more about universal basic income. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of support in the pandemic for people who haven't been able to work. And this is something that I think will probably become more common. And it is also something that could counteract that algorithm argument, because if you have your basic income guaranteed and you don't have to worry so much about money, will you create more uh, original things, create for the joy of it rather than chasing various things and be more experimental? I definitely think so. And the other thing is with the, I guess, with the algorithm side of Amazon, there's plenty of room in some of the lesser known categories. And I'll talk about this again in a minute. I think that we still, um, I mean, there is the bigger money in some of the bigger categories, but there are still niches where people are writing different things. So I'll talk about that soon. Uh, also mentioned, wanted to mention the Six Figure Author podcast this week, which covered the struggles that we face as authors, both from the point of view of Joe and Lindsay and Andrea, uh, the co-hosts, but also the community who sent in some of their struggles. Some of those struggles include the practical aspects of for example, maintaining multiple series across different subgenres and even multiple names, which I completely understand. What is funny, again, as readers, I get people who, for example, people who really like my um, uh, desecration and those crime thrillers, uh, which are have an edge of the supernatural and have a psychic in them and are not mainstream at all. And they're like, when are you going to write more of those? And then I get people who are like, why are you not writing more arcane books? And so people tend to like the genre they they read and or of course there's non-fiction as well I'm moving into travel writing uh too <laughs> in addition to everything else uh, so yes it's definitely that is definitely a challenge they also talk about self-doubt combining writing what you love with what might sell which again we've just talked about dealing with physical and emotional trauma while still trying to write and I think a lot of us have had a lot of that over the last couple of years and much more this is a great topic because we all struggle that we all writing is part of our life and life has a lot of struggles and there's a moment Andrea talks about this sort of moment where sometimes you look up and go do you know what? Everything's working fine right now. And you have this realisation. In fact, I've got on my wall, this too shall pass. And that's for both good things and bad things. It's a very memento mori thing to think about. Well, if it's good, this too shall pass. If it's bad, this too shall pass. <laughs> so we get to live in the moment. And if you have that moment of equilibrium, when everything seems wonderful... <laughs> then awesome, celebrate it and then it will change again. So yes, that's the six figure author on the struggles we face as authors. So in my personal update, I am still just waiting for some final comments to come back on Tomb of Relics. Uh, so I have been working on my next course this week and that's going to be my focus for the next few weeks which will be on how writers can use AI in both the creative process and for publishing and marketing. And I'll have that out before mid-November probably. And I am loving pulling this information together. You know how much I enjoy this futurist stuff. And every time I look at it and dive a bit deeper into each of the areas, things have moved on again. <laughs> So the course will be more about an awareness of what's happening in all the different areas that AI is touching, the attitude to cultivate and uh, use AI tools effectively, and a look into the future of what things might be. Uh, so that will be coming up soon. I'll talk about it when it's available. Uh, I've also put two small projects into production with Deep Zen for AI narrated audiobooks. I've decided to actually do this. Uh, one is a non-fiction with a female British voice and I've also put in some short stories with a male American voice which I think will be really interesting because I, so this is A Thousand Fiendish Angels, I've narrated that myself, obviously female British voice, voice of the author but actually two of the stories are written from a male point of view and so it will be very interesting to hear this read by a different voice and this is also what I want to happen with AI narration is that I want people to be able to choose the type of voice that they want to hear stories in and we don't have an app for that yet but it will come. Uh, I'll report on that once it's done it will it will be 
couple of weeks, I'm sure, until uh, that's available and I will uh, do uh, a thing on that. (laughs) And as I've said before, AI narration, the actual uh, technical ability of AI narration is not really an issue anymore. The technology is available. It's more the sales, distribution and marketing because we're not allowed to put those files on the main platforms. For example, ACX and Find A Way are not allowing uh, AI narrated audiobooks. So I will be selling those direct for a lower price than my human narrated editions for sure. I also finally uploaded a hardback on KDP Print for how to make a living with your writing, the third edition, but they don't do author copies in the UK, which is unusual, Uh, but they have to come from Europe. So even though I bought one, I haven't got it yet. (laughs) So I can't look at it, (laughs) even though it is available for sale. And in fact, if you're in Europe or probably the US or possibly even Australia, you can probably get it quicker than me. because of all the supply chain issues right now. And several people have asked what I am doing with hardbacks going forward. Basically, now it's the same as paperbacks and large print, which is I use, I will use both KDP Print and Ingram Spark for all formats because I am wide with my print books. So I will just upload the files on both KDP Print and Ingram Spark and there you go. Because you need to be wide with print if you want to be in libraries, for example. I also posted an article on my books and travel blog this week with day by day pictures from my walk along the St Cuthbert's Way from Melrose in Scotland to Lindisfarne, Holy Island, which includes a picture of the adder I saw at St Cuthbert's Cave, which was one of my highlights. It is very rare to see a snake in the UK and this was just blatantly on the path in front of me and I've never seen an adder in the wild. So that is amazing. Plus, you can see how very beautiful Northumberland is. So if you fancy some virtual travel, head on over to booksandtravel.page forward slash blog. Links in the show notes as ever. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Tyler Harrell said uh, he loved the quote, it's not what you find, it's what you can find out from the interview with Michael Kilman. Uh, He said, love that. I'll be getting their book for world building when I get a chance. As ever, thanks for making me think about my writing in new, better ways. He also says, I've been struggling with creating periods of withdrawal in my own life because of moving and switching work schedules and setting boundaries with the people who love you and asking them to safeguard your time is my goal. And I replied to Tyler, setting boundaries with yourself is also difficult. (laughs) And I think uh, he's responding to a question I asked last week, if you didn't hear that, about how we can create these boundaries in our lives. And I mentioned the tidal tidal movements around Lindisfarne when you're cut off, when the island is cut off. How can we cut ourselves off in order to create? And yeah, I personally find that it's my own boundaries that probably stop me the most. As in, I don't put hard boundaries in enough. And what's so funny is I have to leave the house in order to <laughs> to relax. <laughs> because if I'm in the house, I just work. I just love my work. Can't help it. <laughs> Nicole Lisa says, still catching up on the backlist of the podcast. <laughs> Enjoying the fall foliage on my first road trip in the US after six years abroad. And sent a little picture of a statue of a creature emerging from the bushes, which was cool. And I do find it, I find it hilarious that people listen to the whole backlist of the show and uh, either go backwards in time or forwards in time. <laughs> because if you go backwards in time, it's like you, well, because I do these personal updates and it must just be very weird. I have never listened to any of my shows again. <laughs> So I may, you know, you might hear me say something and then six months later, I'll say something else because we all change our minds, right? And finally, Susie said about the Jonah Lehrer interview, you raised the bar yet again. This, uh, I've enjoyed all the interviews I've heard, but this was the best yet. Interesting and fascinating. Oh, so glad you enjoyed it, Susie. So you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N and send me pictures of where you're listening or email joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this much more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Publisher Rocket, which is appropriate as it's part of the research process for all my books. So Publisher Rocket helps you with keyword and category searches on Amazon, which of course you need for your book metadata and your advertising. And you can generate lists of keywords for your Amazon ads. Plus you can use it for researching where a book might fit or finding those less 
less saturated, I guess, <laughs> categories and keywords to put your books. So I've recently been using uh, Publisher Rocket to research the travel genre subcategories and keywords so I can decide on a title for my upcoming books. So I've got these three travel books in mind and I want to make sure I get the right kind of keywords for the title and find the right category. So I'm doing a lot of research. Now, yes, you can manually spend the time on Amazon doing this, but it takes a lot more time and you have to think about all the different permutations to search for. So Publisher Rocket saves you time and frustration in your research. It makes it easy, which let's face it is what we all need so we can get back to writing. You can also analyse the competition. So I can type in solo travel and Rocket will return a list of ebooks or print books that relate to that keyword phrase. And I can look at their ranking, their price, the number of pages, and then drill down into their categories, which helps me add to my list of possible categories I might want to look at for my books. Now, remember, you can list 10 categories per format of book on Amazon. You just need to find the 10. <laughs> that work best for you and the most appropriate 10. And Rocket helps you discover them when you're first publishing or if you want to change up categories over time as they are changing a lot. And this is really important. I'm actually right now going back through my nonfiction and re-researching -re these things so I can add more categories and the changed categories uh, onto those books. Publisher Rocket also has a super useful AMS keyword search. So you can type in a keyword phrase and then download lists of keywords to upload into the ad platform if you use that. So Publisher Rocket is one of my must use tools as part of my publishing process and it is very reasonably priced. So go check it out at publisherrocket.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you to everyone who supported the show for years and months and to new patrons, Dana, Junetta Key and Rashida Lucy. Thanks to all of you. And I will be doing the Patreon only Q&A uh, in the next week or this week as this goes out. And I'll be answering your questions. And if you are a patron of the show, if you become a patron for just a couple of dollars or euros or Canadian dollars or whatever currencies are possible now, it's possible in many things, uh, then you can ask your questions and get sort of behind the scenes extra stuff and money off my ebooks, audiobooks and courses. So you can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Vicky Carter is the author of Research Like a Librarian, Research Help and Tips for Writers for Researching in the Digital Age. So welcome, Vicky. Hi there, Joanna. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you today about this because I think it's so important. But before we get into it, tell us a bit more about your background, because I know you struggled a bit in your early experiences with books. Oh, I did. And it's such an um, interesting part of my story. And I just actually started to talk about it with people as I wrote my first book. So when I was younger in elementary school, I had a speech impediment. And that really, and I also was a very slow reader and very slow learner. Um, so we didn't discover this until about halfway through first um, grade. So when I was in school, I didn't talk very often, which surprises everybody when they know me now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like all you do is talk. But so I really struggled with reading and seeing words formulate on a page or on a chalkboard. I couldn't, my brain couldn't quite um, grasp that concept. So now we know it's dyslexia and it was very severe dyslexia. But at the time when I was little, I didn't know that. And then compounded with a speech impediment, I just turned super shy because I would get teased all the time, you know, as kids do that. So when I was little, I wouldn't go out and play out on recess very often. I would hide myself away in the libraries of our schools because the librarians were off awesome. They'd let me come in, get books, and I'd always get picture books. And those were the, the how I would sit and I would re look at the picture books, trying to decipher how the pictures were related to the words until um, I did get some help. I had two amazing teachers that identified that there was some possibility of some help for me. And I started with speech therapy, and then we started with reading and writing therapy. So about the fifth grade, I caught up a little bit with everybody else, but I've always been 
painfully slow reader and a very painfully slow writer. (laughs) But that experience of being around the library and the librarians, it became a sanctuary to me. So books have become my sanctuary now. Oh, I think for many of us, the library is a sanctuary. It certainly was for me as an introvert child, totally bookish. I spent a lot of time in the library. And I think that's why so many of us care about libraries now is mm-hmm. because of how they've affected us in, in earlier life. But so you actually became a librarian. Is that right? I did. I had this interesting journey to a librarian. Um, It was a little later on in life. I went back to college at university as an adult student with two children in tow, and I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. I kept going back to the idea of books, writing, um, researching, but I didn't know how that would work out into a career. I didn't really dawn on me as a librarian until I started to work in the school district where my daughters were, and I worked in the school library. And I'm like, oh, this could be a totally thing. It dawned on me. So I started to go back to school and I ended up working at the public library in our area while I was working on my bachelor's because I really felt like I wanted to have a broad experience. So I worked in the public library and I loved that. And then finally, when I started on my master's, I was recruited to work at the community college library in our area as in the library department. And so I finished my master's and stayed with academic library work. So that was my journey. It had, I didn't come out of high school, go right to college. I lived a life, (laughs) traveled with my kids and husband, and then went back to school as an adult. And I landed in the library world and I absolutely loved it. And now I'm in higher education. I, I work as a librarian as a faculty member, as well as a faculty member for University Online. I love your story because I really think that dyslexia, speech impediment, slow <laughs> learner, all these words that you say, uh, many people would think, well, you'll never have a f- future with books. But, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a problem with books. It's a problem with seeing how the words fit in a page, as you mm-hmm. say, and, mm-hmm. and in the world. But I love that you've come through that. And um, I, I know you've obviously you help other people and there are lots of people listening who know people with um, learning difficulties. I guess we call them now, yeah. but I hope yeah. that encourages people or if their kids are going through it or whatever, or even as an adult, you know, it's not like you need to fix it because you're not broken, but there, exactly. are ways, <laughs> there are ways that you can adapt either yourself mm-hmm. or the world <laughs> to make mm-hmm. it make yep. sense. Yeah. And that's exactly what I learned. I didn't learn that out of the bat. I did feel like all the way through high school that I was broken. Even when I was working, you know, I worked in journalism in high school in our newspaper and I had a teacher, she was really harsh on me. And instead of sitting down and giving me, helping me find the tools to edit my work, she, you know, was really a challenge for me to work with. It wasn't until I got older and in college and started working with adult education myself, I realized there's some awesome tools out there. And for dyslexics, the number one awesome tool is audio. So um, having things read back to you in an audio version or having somebody else read it back to you or even reading it back to yourself, that's going to help you find a lot of your errors. So when I discovered that, I'm like, oh, the world is now open. <laughs> Forget it. I'm writing my books. <laughs> oh, excellent. I'm so glad. So let's get into this book then. Sure, so sure. why is research important regardless of genre and how can it help us, I guess, as writers? I love that question. And it's a question I get asked a lot. So as a librarian, I really believe that authors can have their voice strengthened very well with excellent research. And it gives to their voice an awesome authority. So research is a discipline, just like the writing craft is a discipline. And it's a learned discipline. None of us came out of the womb knowing how to write epic novels. And most of us don't come out um, knowing how to do excellent research. It's And research is a higher level thinking skill. So as you're processing questions that you may need to go have um, define and redefine your storyline, it's actually helping you in a higher level thinking. And so when I say authority, I I look at it this way. The truth is in the world, there's a lot of literary voices out there. And not all of them are necessarily excellent in their researching skills. But what makes researching fabulous for authors is it lends to their voice. And so let me give an example of that. I don't know, you probably have seen this before in conferences 
or in online chats or whatever with an author and an author's character or plot development or even some of their aspects of their book work was challenged by a reader. You know, that didn't really happen that way or I don't believe that's realistic. And so with those challenges come the opportunity, I feel like, for authors to really show their authority in their voice if they've done research prior to writing, even if it's a fantasy world, I believe that you can do some research to really lend to authority. And it strengthens authors' voices because it gives them the ability to stand up on what they've created. Um, so, but I have to stop and say, not all challenges are necessarily meaningful for authors to get into, right? Some are just based <laughs> on subjective ideas or tastes or value, you know, that kind of a thing. But as far as an author goes, if they had a source that inspired them and they have they have um, research that helped inspire them creating their world, their story that they're telling, and they do get challenged, what's really great is that authority gives them the ability to stand up on what they've created. And I really feel like when authors do research well, that's what that authority and their and creating their voice is all about. And yes, just to stress, <laughs> this is for <laughs> fiction and nonfiction. I mm-hmm. mean, but it, but it's interesting. I think you're right. People, you have to choose what you research. So I was just thinking then around Tom Clancy, you know, well known for highly technical details of certain guns mm-hmm. and tanks mm-hmm. and things. And I couldn't care less about that. Like I, I, but if you read one of my novels, you're going to get the architectural details of a particular cathedral. And if we find a work of art, it's going to be described in an exactly researched way. So I feel like you have to choose your what you're going to research. It, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be every single thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. For example, I'll give you an example. A book I'm working on right now is around the the planning of the city that I live in. It's going to have its 100th year anniversary in two years, its birthday. And so I live in one of the original homes. And so for a long time, I've had the idea of writing a historical fiction around the planned city in the 1920s. And it was literally planned by the uh, lumber baron that came here to, um, and there's tons of history around it. I'm not going for accuracy here. I really want to tell the story of the feeling of what it would have been like to come and live here and, um, and help build the city. And so even though I'm researching a lot about what the buildings would have looked like and how they would have created the city and all the ups and downs it would have done, I'm not going to go accurate detail verbatim. There's already a book out there that tells that in a factual way. I'm going for that as an inspirational way to give the feeling what it would have been like for the people that came here to help build that city. And so that's inspiration. But I still have to do a tremendous amount of research. I'm not living in the 20s. <laughs> I do. And I'm, I'm looking for firsthand accounts of those experiences if I can find them and read what their words were. And then I'm retelling that story in a fictional version of it. So, okay, so you mentioned first-hand accounts there. Mm-hmm. So that would probably mm-hmm. be newspapers or mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. books at the time. I yes. love... I love to go places. I physically visiting, obviously difficult in the pandemic, but I I find that going places really helps me find details that Mm -hmm. I find interesting. So Mm -hmm. what are some of the other ways that authors can do research? I love it. So what I call what you just described, I call that living research, the traveling to different regions, even going online and watching travel channels, TV shows, YouTube channels, things like that will what I consider living in in research. Anything that you do in your daily life can be considered research, amazingly enough. So that's one thing. The other thing is in the the digital age, we can kind of, we can definitely conduct research online. But I would always encourage authors to steer clear of just doing research on just Google or Wikipedia to totally broaden themselves. Um, and I talk a lot about in my book about academic library websites, museum websites, using library research guides on academic libraries. There's just a wealth of ins- information out on online that is reliable besides Google and Wikipedia. And I talk about where Google and Wikipedia can be useful, <laughs> but the um, online, you can go to so many things. I talk, I had a girlfriend remind me how great YouTube is for doing some research. And so there's just a lot on there. The other one that I really encourage individuals authors to use is to conduct research using expert, what I call expert witnesses or firsthand accounts. And in the digital age, we have such a great opportunity for that because there's many 
libraries, major libraries, like here in the United States, the Library of Congress has done a lot of digital archiving of firsthand interviews of individuals from all par parts of history. And, and they have volunteers that do this that will go out and interview individuals from their past, you know, in the 1920s and, and even beyond if they got those. And they're putting those in digital records so that people can go and listen to those firsthand accounts, as well as a lot of journals and newspapers and those kinds of things are being digitized. So you can access those things, which I feel like are a goldmine for an author. Um, and then also everybody, I feel like everybody kind of looks at research as going into these big gigantic caverns of a library, the big archives and dusting off the old books and sitting there. And I think that is valuable and it's fun and you can do that when the pandemic I think comes back, we could go do some of that again. But it also is not necessarily the most effective way of doing research because it's hard to really grasp what's going on in those gigantic archives. But luckily for us, they're in the digital age, most major libraries are putting a lot of their archives and museums and things like that are putting their collections online for us to do research. Cologne Cathedral, they only recently just put on this amazing kind of 3D uh, scrolling thing. So you could stand at different points in the cathedral and then turn the mouse, you know, look up to the ceiling and see the colours. And I mean, I really just wanted to go to Cologne to see the cathedral. <laughs> Isn't it fantastic? And and I think there's a lot more of that because I saw at the beginning of the pandemic, I put together a whole bunch of resources for my students who are adult students and on museums that were starting to open up a lot of their, they were trying to get people to visit virtual museums. And there were so many of them and they're keeping them online. And it's just, it's phenomenal to me. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely changed it, it, since the pandemic started. Like I think in the first sort of six months, they didn't do anything. And then suddenly there was this acceleration of everything going online. So that's really good. But I think one of the issues is when when a source is good enough. And again, that mm -hmm. will depend on the situation. So for example, I watched mm -hmm. a, a video on uh, at an Appalachian snake handling church. Which, <laughs> <laughs> I look right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, which was, it was about, it was about an hour and mm -hmm. it was actually a church service in the Appalachian mountains. Mm -hmm. And I essentially just wrote down what I saw and that became my first scene in my thriller end of days. And so mm -hmm. in a way it doesn't matter so much in that situation whether I got specific details right because it wasn't it was for fiction but I still mm -hmm. got enough right for that to matter but if it's non-fiction if it's like you said historical fiction which people get really upset about mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. how do we know when a source is good enough like you said don't just use google or wikipedia yeah. but how yeah. do we know even these days with a book you know, there's plenty of self-publishers <laughs> out there oh yeah 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 that's such a great question Joanna and that's what us librarians call information literacy. It's what we teach in academic universities to our students. And it's something that I feel like everybody in this decade needs to know an understanding of information literacy, because there's so much vast information out there. And there's three, there's, there's quite a few criteria that us librarians like to teach, but I boiled it down to three of them and made it really easy with the letter A, accuracy, authority, and aim. So when you're looking at a resource, if you can remember those three things as you're evaluating, using that higher level thinking skill, right, as you're looking at a source, there's some things that you need to really consider. How accurate is the information are you using? And now that might be where your question comes from, right? How accurate is, I don't know. Do I need to go and look for other sources that show me that this was accurate? Um, and that's that's a possibility. Authority, does that source show authority? You know, who put that source out there? What is their authority? And I'll go into some of the questions in that in a second. And aim is what is the objectivity of that particular source? What's the whole point of what they're doing? Why are they sharing their information to the world, right? Mm. And so for accuracy, does that information 
correlate and align with information you can find in other reputable sources. For example, for you with that source, that if you really wanted to use it in a historical fiction or maybe a nonfiction, you can go and verify if that is how a church setting would have been done, possibly through other sources. And you can coll- collaborate those two together. And then you can say, okay, this is accurate, right? Mm-hmm. Um For authority, the credentials, the background of the authors, the training and the experience of the authors, and that could be the creators, that's something you might have to do a little digging on to see what is their background. Do they have any authority to be talking about this subject? And in that example that you gave to us, it might have been their pastors that wanted to, you know, evangelize using this, the medium of showing off what they do, right? So Mm. what's their background? I mean, I would seriously be doing digging on the background because that's just me, but that's kind of one thing you want to look for in authority. And these are just one question in my book. I have quite a bit more questions that authors can ask as they're evaluating sources. And finally, I missed one, AIM. So AIM, what is the purpose of this particular piece, the source, this content? Are they trying to sell me something? Are they trying to persuade me? If so, what is that that they're trying to sell? What are they trying to persuade? What are they trying to give me, you know, that information? What's the point of it? If you can remember those three things and do that higher level thinking, and then finally try to collaborate your source to as close to a primary or original or an authoritative source as possible, then that is going to be the the best you're going to get for knowing if this um, source is good enough and reliable enough. I think that's great. And again, we're not suggesting that authors need to do this for every single thing that they're writing Mm -mm. about. Mm -mm. It's more a case of, I guess, when you said aim, the aim of the source, but also your aim as the author Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. important to know what, how much you should research and when it's important. So One of the things that I find very important when I'm researching is if I'm reading a book, I will write notes in quotes. So if I am copying a quote down, I Mm -hmm. put quote marks, you know, I'll have at the top of the page, it will say the book name and the author name, and then I'll have quote marks and then I'll have my own thoughts, won't have quote Mm -hmm. marks. So Mm -hmm. that's a way that I keep, I make sure that I keep information in a certain way. So what are your recommendations for keeping notes as we research so we don't plagiarize or do something bad? I love it. And your example is exactly what I would suggest. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and here's one thing I wanted to touch on as far as the last three things I talked about. There's a difference between, and this needs to be talked about in your notes too, is what is going, what is used for your inspiration and what might be used for actual source like um quote, quote. right? Mm, Yeah, mm. quotes. So, so what I do in my notes, which is really important is I will also write, how will I use this work? Or how is this work or this source going to be used in my work? I'll just do how to use it. And if it's for inspiration, I'll just say for inspiration or inspirational idea or something like that. But if I'm going to be using it for direct quotation or whatever that then I'll say, use for direct quotation on this topic. So I always make sure I make my memory's not fantastic. So I have to make sure I put down in my notes that note taking is probably one of the best questions I get all the time. And it really, notes are really about a personal preference, but I think notes should be incredibly short for memory purposes. And I think that's where people get a little sidetracked or put off on doing research is that they're, oh my gosh, I got to take all these notes. And in reality, you really don't. What you need to be doing is writing at least the title, the author, possibly the publication of the information, how you accessed it. Because I don't know about you, John, but like I said, my memory can be bad and I could forget where that book I found it or where that online source was that I found. And then again, paraphrasing, you can paraphrase what that source is talking about. So, um, like if it's a document that that has some data, statistics data for, you know, deaths in the 1920s that I was really going for one thing, right? Then I'll say this talks about examples for A, B, and C. And then, like I said, you, how am I going to use that in my work? That's kind of the minimum when it comes to note taking, in my opinion. Um And all of the title, author, publication, all that, that can all be handled very well with a a citation. And so if you're using an online citation generator, which I talk about 
um, a little in my book and also I talk about in a workshop that I'm going to be doing here soon how to do that. You can cut out a lot of that with just getting all of that bibliography reference information, right, in that, and then use the rest of that note of paraphrasing what the source is about, and how are you going to use it in your work, and that's really to help your memory. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, and I think that citations, footnotes, etc., I think they are very common in academic Mm -hmm. books and certain types of nonfiction, but with fiction or even just more pop pop nonfiction mm-hmm. like I write uh, I use appendices I use an author's note I use resource list obviously if I quote people within a text that's usually in nonfiction and I'll have their name and the book and everything but I I personally don't use footnotes or citations mm-hmm. but I always in my fiction if you read the author's note I'm going to tell you where mm-hmm. I got the ideas and also a book list I always have a bibliography as well so you said they're about using so, cita- citations but what should authors do? What's the minimum? I mean, we have to do something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I love this question. I just had this conversation with another author on our patron group this weekend because we were talking about this. And so this is in my mind how I separate the two. So and this is for fiction. So nonfiction, we've already established for most nonfiction, almost all nonfiction, there will be some sort of citations in text citations, or at the end, there will be a list, right? But for fiction, where do we come into this, right? And that's where the number one question I get a lot. In fiction, what are you talking about, Vicki? <laughs> Why do I need to do this, right? Okay, so I love when authors use author notes, or they use acknowledgments in fiction work at the end, where what inspired them, or how this world, or this in book was storyline was created from resources that they've used and they somehow let me know what those are as a reader I love that because once again that goes back to the authority of the author right I know they've taken the time to do some um, higher level thinking about their storyline and even if it was inspiration and so what I challenge fiction authors regardless if you use a source or not and it was just inspiration you should at least keep it in your personal notes as a log of what those research basics were, which is the title of the book, possibly how it inspired you or the source and how you did use it or you planned on using it in your book for two reasons. One, you never know when that inspiration is going to hit for something else later, right? (laughs) For another Mm. storyline or another book. Number two, once again, if there is ever a reason for any sorts of challenges from anywhere, you know that you can go back, oh, wait, I got, I know how this inspiration came. And you can go back to your notes and you can verify where that inspiration came and you can address anything that may come up. It doesn't always come up. I don't want people to think that every book's going to get challenged, but it is very uncomfortable in a situation when it does happen. And, and it just lends to that authority as an author that says, I know how I, I created this book in this world and it was inspired by people. And I also believe that keeping a log of what inspired authors in your work is giving a kind of acknowledgement to where you're inspired is very important. So that's that um, karma aspect in my mind, right? And so if you do that at the end of your fiction book and say, this is what inspired me, that also gives the readers an opportunity to explore other opportunities of how this reader was, how this writer was expired, which gives the reader such a vast more knowledge of who you are as a writer. And that also just brings in so much good things for <laughs> for writers in my world <laughs> yeah I, I, I agree know. with you as, as a reader I want an author's note I get upset if there isn't one because mm-hmm. I, want, I do too you know, yeah I want <laughs> and I want the book list and I will often go and follow and this is with fiction you know let alone non-fiction and then it was interesting hearing you talk because I I've definitely always done this I have a lot of journals and I write out notes from books and things so I've always got a kind of log but I realized that this not everyone does this in the same mm-hmm. way but what mm-hmm. we're also saying is it's important to do it for acknowledgments and attribution uh, mm-hmm. to stop plagiarism but if, absolutely <laughs> but the other thing is we can try our very hardest and something might creep in that we didn't mean so how yes. can we make sure we have not plagiarized someone else's work even if we didn't uh, do it on purpose. I'm assuming yeah. that people are not doing it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, th- and that was the one, you know, when I get asked this question, that's the number one thing I like to point out. 
And as a librarian, especially in the academic world, I've had to be involved in cases where students had been flagged for their work for plagiarism. And what's interesting in all the cases, which there have been a few, right, in my mm. world, um, I have discovered when I sat down and talked with that student, and we'll call them an author at this point, and I found out, I find out that it's not intentional. It's almost 99% of plagiarism is unintentional. Now, if you're asking the question, how can I avoid plagiarism? It's pretty safe and sound that you're probably not going to plagiarize. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the intentional plagiarism is a whole different animal. And I wrote a piece of just recently that came out in for another magazine here in the United States, a friend of mine about how I was actually plagiarized at the very beginning of my writing career when I was very young and the devastation that happens for the writer when you find, when you realize your work was intentionally plagiarized and how to recover from that. But as far as how to avoid plagiarism, there's some really wonderful aspects that every writer, author should remember. And this goes for if you're doing this in your notes or if you're going to use this in your work. So if you do use quotes or somebody else's work in your work, you can use signal words, which means according to or, you know, a signal word. And there's quite a few lists of signal words that you can use to indicate that you're not the one that's speaking this words, even if you you paraphrase. And then you should paraphrase. You should never directly take somebody's work cut and paste and put it directly into your work and claim it as your own. And I know that sounds very basic, but you would be surprised how often that happens. And I don't think, again, once again, I don't think it's intentional. I think what happens is that people will use a cut and paste as a marker for them to go back and try to remember to rewrite that or re-paraphrase, but then they forget, they get rushed or whatever, and they don't do that. (laughs) And so that's where you just, just, it's just best not to cut and paste. What's best is to immediately paraphrase in your notes or in your work ex- what that author was saying, and then acknowledge that. Acknowledge who the original creator was. And then once again, citations are valuable. And if you do those in your own work, when you go to publish or in your notes, I think that will help to keep us from accidentally plagiarizing (laughs) because it really Mm. is not intentional for majority of people yes I think you're exactly right do not cut do not cut cut and paste or copy and paste like oh uh I want to describe let's say Cologne Cathedral so I do not copy and paste from Wikipedia into my Scrivener Mm -hmm. document what I might well do is open up my notebook and copy out Mm -hmm from Wikipedia, Gothic, Spire, whatever. I might write down words that come from Wikipedia, but into my Scrivener, I'm then paraphrasing from my written notes. And Mm -hmm. we should say it is okay to use a direct quote in quotation marks, as long as either you have permission or it is fair use. So for example, me quoting one line um, out of a very long book is completely fine. Me quoting a, a song lyric is not okay. Or oh, a poem. song lyrics are a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, just song lyrics are a nightmare. Stay away from song <laughs> lyrics. <laughs> yes, exactly. But that's it. so. I think you're exactly right. The main thing is do not cut and paste or copy and paste from one thing into your master manuscript. That I think that's a good point. Have a um, your where you take your notes is a different place to what your actual manuscript is. And then, yeah, as you say, what about plagiarism checkers like Pro Writing yep. Aid has one, Grammarly, et cetera? Yep. And they're, they're useful. And I think they're valuable that you can run your, your pieces through plagiarism checkers. We do instruct our students in the university that they have to do that before they submit to us for grading. Yet we still get people that <laughs> come mm. up with. And our, our numbers are very, like our numbers low. You cannot have more than, like, I think it's 20% of a anything, it will get trigger us to just immediately kick it back to a student and say, okay, let's have a discussion about how you handle citations, notations, and things like that. But yes, I think that if you're really that concerned about your writing, as far as if you're plagiarizing or not, I think the first step is to really practice paraphrasing in your notes first. And practice creating citations. And then when if all else, if you've done all that and you still are concerned, then run it through a checker. <laughs> but I kind of feel like if you really work that higher order level of paraphrasing a source, you're you're probably not 
going to plagiarize, but it could be possible <laughs> that mm. you do. Um, but the, even with paraphrasing, still, if I, let's say I paraphrase an idea that came from someone else, I'm still saying, you oh, know, heavens, acknowledge where you got yeah. that inspiration. Absolutely. Exactly. And that, that is a professionalism. That's giving credit where credit is due. And unfortunately, not everybody does that. I mean, we just have to look at blogs, writing blogs or whatever. And there's been a lot of controversy over that not happening. And it's devastating. So in all honesty, if you're going to paraphrase, give credit to where that inspiration is. As you you mentioned karma. It's it's about respect. It's about mm-hmm. copyright, as you said. It's professionalism. Mm-hmm. Also, it's about marketing each other. So I always yes. like uh, with my nonfiction in particular. I always look for author friends who I can quote things from, so that I can link to their books. <laughs> yes. Well, I did that with my book with you. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you you talked very distinctly. I was just it was funny because I was listening to one of your books and I was writing mine, and you were talking about Wikipedia and not cut and paste. I'm like, oh, I don't even have to say it. Joanna just said it. So I'll just (laughs) quote her in it. (laughs) Exactly. And And we want that as authors, we want other people to quote our work in a respectful way and link back to us. And then it creates like this web of referrals. And so, yeah, I think we're, what we're saying is it's a very positive thing to quote people, to cite people, to reference other people. And that that is an important part of the process. It really is. And what it does as well is once again, it gives that authority to the writer because it acknowledges that that writer is exploring their craft and their world and they're learning from others and they want to share what they've learned from others. And they're presenting that to their reader from what they have learned from somebody else in an authoritative way. And that just lends authority to your voice when you do it and you do it correctly and you give credit. And then it just does create that really great community connection for readers as well as in the writer's community. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So so the book is research like a librarian and mm-hmm. people many listeners want to get their books into libraries <laughs> so yes. as a librarian and what are your tips for authors on approaching librarians in an appropriate way rather than just like hey way here's my fantastic. book <laughs> you just said the right word appropriate way so this comes all down to once again a lot of things the some of the keys to remember to getting your book in a library as I am a big believer in relationship building and libraries and librarians are humans as well. And so the appropriate way is to start out by thinking about getting your books in the library as a relationship builder as well. So if you haven't already connected with that library somehow, it's probably really important to get connected with that library without selling your book first. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. if there's a way that you can do that, you can, there's oftentimes experience, Minus COVID, prior to COVID, there was there's a lot of libraries, local libraries and other libraries that will hold events, call for speakers, especially authors. They love to bring authors in. So if you jump on that, then you can get to know um, those individual players in the library that might be the potential buyers. And that's where it comes down to doing a little bit of research as well, because in the library industry and in the library um, world, there are specific purchase requirements and ram, you know, criteria for every library. And not every person that stands behind a desk at a library is going to be able to purchase a book mm-hmm. for the library. There's very specific guidelines. For example, the public library that I worked at, we could make recommendations, formal recommendations to our library director. And he would take those those, their written document that we had, we could email to him if we had a book we wanted him to purchase for the collection. And then he would take those and he only had a budget and a specific time that he would be purchasing. So that's another thing you need to remember is that the library doesn't have infinite amount of funds. Most libraries are um, funded by municipal properties, taxes, things like that, and they have budgets. And they will only do some spending at certain times of the year for books as well. And that's where that relationships of getting to know people in the library and also doing your research on them, you're going to be able to target 
when you do your pitch for them to buy in a more appropriate manner. So what would happen with us is that he would take all of those recommendations. And when it was time for him to purchase, he would go through the catalogs. So that's another tip. You have to know what distribution your that library is going to be purchasing from. As independent authors, we now have great opportunities to get our books in specific distributions to be able to get your books into the hands of libraries. Yes. So if just on that, is it ebook, print book, audio? Does it still favor they, print? They actually, libraries from what I've heard in the industry is they are going a lot with ebooks as well. So print is fantastic, but they tend to be more expensive. So they can um, purchase more and have access more for ebooks. There is just the issue with some libraries of how they distribute those to individuals and how the money, there's a whole thing on, on that in the world. But they, there is a lot of um, availability for ebooks as well. And so I want to share with the listeners two amazing resources that I have found about this particular question. And one's really funny because it's on your your page. It's from Eric Simmons and his book marketing, How to Get Your Book into a Library. I think it was a couple of years ago, he was on your website and he wrote mm. an article about it and it is phenomenal. I read it quite a few years ago I mean, when it came out and I have it bookmarked because it's one of the best resources. He has done a great job of laying out some steps for authors on how to approach libraries, what um, distribution. And he also gives a phenomenal resource for how he did it, his own database and his email, his professional email pitch that he used for those libraries that he didn't have a, a, a working relationship with. So I highly recommend finding that on Joanna's website, because if you're asking that question, that's a great resource. And then Anne Merrick's on the Alliance for Independent Authors Advice Center. She also wrote a really great article, I think it was a year ago, about this subject. And the Alliance for Independent Authors Advice Center also has several other articles about how to get your eBooks into libraries. And it's, it's, very up to date as well. So those are two awesome resources. Just You just have to remember that it's really about our relationship building first, getting to know how that library purchases and how where they purchase and what type of um, items, we call them items in the library, they will purchase when they purchase, and then how to professionally pitch your particular book to them. And it's all going to come from some sort of relationship that you're building. Now, if you're doing research in that library, that's your key in. So if you're already there asking questions about your book while you're writing it, and you've made connections with the librarians at that time, and you acknowledge those librarians in that book, there's a pretty vast chance that they're going to purchase that book for the collection. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> so that's, that's a great tip right there. <laughs> that is great. I would also say my tips on this are publish wide. So make sure your ebooks, mm-hmm. print books and audio books can be pub- can be bought by libraries. Yeah. And the second yeah. thing is ask your readers to ask. So whenever oh, I, I forgot about that one. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's a big one. So of course, mm-hmm. anyone listening, you can ask your library. You should be able to do this pretty much anywhere in the world now. Mm-hmm. Ask your librarian to order uh, your favorite or author's books or mine or Vicky's <laughs> uh, <laughs> into your library. And I have found that that's pretty much how my books have appeared in libraries is because readers have actually asked for them to be put into the catalogue. And I mean, even if they're on something like Overdrive, mm-hmm. I think most libraries, that's a digital, you know, ebook catalogue. Yeah, their, um, their people, main one, yes. people still need curation in some way. So mm-hmm. asking your readers to ask librarians for your books is a, is a really good way. Well, here's the hierarchy that I'm going to share with you as a backstage person in the library. So if a patron, we call them patrons in the library world, but there are people that come and use the services, they make a recommendation for a book that gets put up on a higher order than if a faculty, or sorry, not faculty, but a, a library staff member does, because automatically that indicates to the buyer. So the buyer can be the, the library director, it could be a subject matter expert, meaning a reference library in history, depending on how big the library is. There may be specific librarians that do specific purchasing as well. But if a patron or a 
customer comes and makes a recommendation, that goes up a little bit higher on the list than any other recommendations, including recommendations from blogs or publishers that come Ooh, to so, that's exciting. so yeah. So if that and I forgot about that tip, Joanna, because it's really important. And it's because there's already an audience that they know that is going to possibly check out this book. So where us as authors, purchasing books is important in a library, how often that book gets checked out or circulated is another importance because circulation numbers matters. That's what keeps the doors open. And so if it's a high demand book that there's a lot of people asking to have it available in the collection, it's going to be patrons asking, it's going to be more than likely they're going to get that book purchased. Oh, that is a great tip. So lots more tips in your book. So where can, where <laughs> yes. can people find you and your book yes. and everything you do online? Oh, and I got a lot going online. So um, my website is theauthorslibrarian.com. And that's specifically for where you can go to purchase my book. You can visit my new growing YouTube channel because I'm trying to do a YouTube channel with discussing these topics. Uh, I will be on doing an online course for authors on research. And I do have a checklist um, on for authors and how to avoid plagiarism. So there's a checklist there. I'm on social media, vickyj.com. Carter is my main Instagram, but I also have Authors Library. I live on Instagram. That's the one I prefer, but I do have a (laughs) Facebook and Twitter. I'm very visual, so Instagram lends to that for me. And um, and also, I'm going to be at the um, a presenter for the self publishing conference here in October, which I'm pretty excited about. And I'll be doing a 45 minute mini presentation basically on on these topics that we're talking about. And you can find all of that on my website, theauthorslibrarian.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Vicky. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. So I hope you found the interview with Vicky interesting and that you learned a few tips about researching or getting your books into libraries. So next week, I'm talking about writing memoir on a difficult personal topic with Corrie Shrum. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.